Good afternoon and welcome. Thanks for having me. It's good to see everybody. Uh, would you please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, thank you all for coming today. It's great to see a good turnout today. Um, so this is our last meeting, program meeting for 2022. Uh, next month is our annual holiday open house. It's December 11th from 1 to 3.30 in the afternoon. <coughs> and our theme this year is celebrating historic Queens, like the sign says down below. Um, so the open house is going to mark the beginning of two upcoming celebrations. One is the 25th anniversary of the founding of this organization. So 2023, we've been here 25 years. And then uh, the town of Queemans, it's not really the town, it's the founding of Queemans by Baron Peter Queemans, uh, celebrating the 350th anniversary of the founding of Queemans. Many here, because you're some of you are my age, uh, will remember 1973 was the big tricentennial here in town. That was a huge celebration. So our exhibits that we're working on are going to focus on the 1973 celebration. And then we're also um, creating some new exhibits. One is on the history of slavery in Queemans. Uh, the other is Queemans during the Revolutionary War. And we're going to be installing some new timeline panels that will be up on the top part of our wall area. They're being printed as we speak. And uh, they're going to show a timeline for the last, I think, John Bonifati is creating those, and I think that's the last four centuries he's doing right now. So it'll be four big panels. Uh, so that's exciting. It's new stuff for us, and we're anxious to get them up. Uh, we also uh, have expanded our World War II exhibit. That's a five-year running exhibit. Started last year, and we're basically focusing on an anniversary milestone of World War II, so we started it last year, and every year we're adding to it. <clears throat> this year's exhibit is focusing on the 20, I think it's 23 individuals who sacrificed their life for our country here in the town of Queens, uh in various theaters during World War II. With that, uh, I'll give you some information on our 2023 speaker series. So in January, January 8th, I will be doing a presentation on the history of the Catholic community here in Queemans, uh, mainly focusing on St. Patrick's Church and the history of that uh, parish. And then February 12th, John Blaisdell, who's with us today, is going to do a presentation on the Fletcher Blaisdell Diaries. He and Linda, his sister Linda, have transcribed those and uh, uh, created a book that John's going to talk to us about both the process and uh, a little bit about Fletcher and his history and some of the great things that are written in that diary. It's a pretty interesting book. On March 12th, Dennis Whalen will do a presentation on the Queemans Water Fund based on the 1865 Burley map. If everybody's familiar, we've got a copy on the wall back there, but he's going to take, Dennis has been doing research and He's been putting it on Facebook, but little snippets of the Burley map and kind of talking about different buildings. So this presentation is going to pretty much focus on the waterfront, at least in, right now that's what he's saying. He may, you never know who does, he may end up expanding it. He's got a lot of interesting stories and a lot of information. Uh, April 16th, our own Tom Sweeney is going to do a talk on the history of Stevensville, Alcove, and Indian Fields. So if you notice the theme here, we're trying to keep everything focused on the town appointments of local history for all of 2023. With that, in the fall, let me just turn the page here. We have three presentations. We haven't scheduled which month is going to be which, but John Bonafini is going to do a talk on the parish family, parish cemeteries at the end of UC Boulevard and he's been doing research on the parish family and he's going to do a presentation on that. Roger Wilbur, who's been working diligently going through all of our old newspapers 
and cataloging all the businesses that have been in the community over the years. And Judd Rogers is going to do a presentation on those and try to even pick out certain buildings and give you a history of what was in a building over a period of time. So that is another interesting. And then Karen Hess is coming back to do a presentation on Barrett Queens in the fall. And that brings us to today's presentation. Uh, before I introduce Dick, I just want to mention Steve Douglas is with us today also. And at the end of Dick's presentation, Steve's just going to talk a little bit about his new venture, Rail River Brewing, and he has a few samples for you to try. Uh, so we'll do that at the end of Dick's presentation. With that, we're pleased to welcome Dick Muccio, who uh, will talk about Peter Bronx beer brewing and the early brewing technology. Uh, he will discuss a brief history of beer brewing, its arrival in the Hudson Valley, and Peter Bronx from Beverwick, and uh, who moved to the area in 1663. Dick holds a bachelor's degree in history from Hofstra University and a master's degree in reading. He relocated to the Hudson Valley in 1974 to teach at the Catskill School District. In 2004, he retired from teaching and now spent his free time volunteering, gardening, raising bees, brewing beer, making wine, reading, and spending time with his grandchildren. He also currently serves as a trustee for Green County Historical Society. So with that, please join and welcome Dick Lugia. Technology, oh, it worked. <laughs> Can you hear me? Oh, yes. Before I start, uh, are there any home brewers in the audience? Used to be. Okay, because like, if there is, if you have something you want to share during the question and answer period, please do. It, I always learn something new myself. Okay, um, before I begin, I have a request. Could you save your questions to the end of the presentation? It flows much smoother that way. Okay, I appreciate that. I thank you in advance. Okay, my talk is, uh, has three B's. Beer, brewing, and bronc. So you'll know when I'm at the end, what's when I get the bronc, I'm almost there. I'd like to start with a very famous quote this okay, from a, a great American, Ben Franklin, who once said, beer is proof that God loves us and wants us to be happy. <laughs> Pretty good quote, huh? Absolutely. Guess what? He never said that. <laughs> what Franklin said, actually he wrote in French to a friend, is wine is proof that God loves us and wants us to be happy. Don't ask me when and don't ask me how, but wine was replaced by beer. And beer drinkers have been quoting Franklin, actually misquoting Franklin, for a very long time. Okay? Well, whether you put beer in there or wine, it's a great quote. Okay? I, like, I like that quote. Um, I guess if you have a glass of beer, and a glass of wine. Everybody, hey, that's the beer. You know what it looks like, what it smells like, and know what it tastes like. Well, what is the definition of beer? Well, beer is defined as a beverage that is uh, derived from grains, flavored with hops, and fermented with yeast. Now, brewers, where's the brewer? Brewers, uh, they have a lot of, uh, of grains to choose from. Rice and corn, oats and barley, wheat and rye, millet, and whatever other grains I don't know about. Okay, I'm sure there's some I've never met. Okay, they have a variety of hops to choose from. There's like six, six, seven pages of hops listed in this book. And today they have many different strains of yeast to select from. We'll talk about hops and yeast, ye yeast uh, a little later on, okay? Now, there are many styles of beer, but really only two kinds of beer. Ales and lagers. Lagers are brewed using yeast that ferments at about 50 degrees, give or take. Some are guessing a little colder. Um, ales are brewed with yeast that ferment at around 70 degrees, 
Mumu and Hadith. Those are the two kinds of beers. So if I as I'm talking today, I'm going to use the word beer, but I'm really talking about ales, because that's what grew back then. Okay, I'm not incorrect because an ale is a kind of beer, and my talk is beer brewing in bronze, and that just sounds nice for three beans. Okay, so that's uh, keep that in mind. Man, uh, us, us Homo sapiens, we have a long relationship with both wine and beer. I have to give you some history lessons. Right? 10,000 years ago, we lived as hunter gatherers. We roamed across the plains, the valleys, wherever we lived, looking for plant life and animal life to survive. Our drinking water came from creeks, streams, and rivers. But eventually, man learns how to farm and herd. This is called the Neolithic Revolution. Okay, changing from hunting and gathering to farming and herding. The Neolithic Revolution gave uh, man a more reliable source of food, okay, and freed up people to slowly, emphasis on the word slowly, build their civilization. Civilizations. I, you're probably not surprised to hear this, but within 1,000 years of becoming a farmer and a herder, man makes his first alcohol and beverage. <laughs> not very surprising, is it? His first beverage is a wine derived from the juice of the Hawthorne berry, rice, and honey. That's the first one. The first beers appear around 8,000 BC, and most historians and uh, archaeologists say it was all it came about by accident. A jug of grain was exposed to rainwater or whatever. No one realized it. The fermentation process, which is natural, took over, and the owner of that jug ended up with a beverage not very tasty. X is super sweet. I, I, don't, I don't know why they drank it. Oh, yes, I do. I know why. Because they got a nice buzz. <laughs> they were men. They weren't stupid. The first uh, wine from uh, grapes appears 5,000 BC. And the first time grain is actually brewed on purpose to produce beer is 3,500 BC in Mesopotamia. And they use barley to make their, their beer. Because remember, it comes from grain. Okay. Now I mentioned that um, the Neolithic Revolution gave man a reliable source of food and time to build a civilization. Neolithic Revolution occurs in many places, many different times, all over the world, and ends up with a whole bunch of different civilizations. I mean, you know a lot of them. But the one we're most interested in is the one that grows and expands from the ancient city of Rome. And the reason we're interested in that is it's the people of Western Europe who come to North America, bringing with them their laws, their religions, their languages, their food, and their beer. So we want to know about these people. You might remember something from Rome from your, oh, I shouldn't do all this, should I? <laughs> Better if I stay here. I'm, so, I'm not used to being filmed. Is this OK? Where was it? Um, you might remember something about the ancient Roman Empire. At its height, it expanded from a, a span from England in the northwest, southeast through France, Spain, Portugal, Italy, into the Mediterranean, into um, the Middle East, Judea, into North Africa, uh, Carthage. Remember some famous leaders, Caesar, um, Nero, and Caligula. You might remember some of their famous engineering achievements. Uh, the Hadrian's Wall, uh, the Colosseum, Appian Way, and aqueducts that brought fresh water, safe to consume water, into cities, and sewers that took the contaminated water out of the cities, drained into rivers and seas where the tide dragged that stuff out into the depths of the ocean. Now, not the best way to deal with sewage, but back then it was. And a combination of the Aqueducts and the sewers guaranteed safe drinking water. Anybody lost? Okay. All right. By 500 AD, the western half of the Roman Empire collapses. Western Europe is overrun by barbarians. Okay. Europe becomes Western Europe becomes very unsafe. There's little trade, little travel, little education. 
okay? The uh, achievements and the ideas of the Romans are either lost, forgotten, or destroyed. To protect themselves from the barbarians, the people in Western Europe retreat into walled cities. That protects them from the barbarians, but with no aqueducts and no sewers. They are guaranteed to eventually pollute their drinking water. They'd be full of dangerous pathogens. Well, how do you solve that problem? Well, they didn't have good air filters or water filters back then. But they, they know what to do. They turned their water into alcoholic beverages. <laughs> the alcohol was, was going to kill all the pathogens, making the water safe to consume. Uh, honey and water became a wine known as mead. Fruits and water became ciders. Grapes and water became wine. And water and grain became beer. Okay? Now these beverages were not consumed so, and produced so people would get rip or drunk and forget they were surrounded by barbarians. They were produced because you have to have a safe way to stay hydrated. Low alcohol ciders and low alcohol beer, called small beer or near beer, having an alcohol percentage of less than 2%. That was enough to kill all the pathogens and make the water safe to drink. These low alcohol beverages were consumed by men, women, children. and children. I don't have any children, so children. Okay? It's safe to drink. Workmen would go to work. Shipbuilders, a very hard job building ships back then. Very hard um, uh, job. They'd sweat like crazy. They have to stay hydrated. So right on the job, they drink some near beer. Near beer is the first form of Gatorade. Stop to think about it. Besides keeping hydrated, these beverages supply nutrients, uh, carbohydrates, vitamins, they were important uh, uh, things to consume, okay? So we can talk about beer for, forever, but that's, that's good enough. Let's move to B, the brewing part of beer. By now, I would imagine most of you have been, i got to stand still, sorry. I'm no, fine. Right. Uh, where was it? Uh, most of you have probably been to a, a big brewery like uh, Budweiser or Miller or maybe a small brew pub and you sat there drinking your favorite brew and you looked across into the, through the glass wall to the brewing operation and you've seen these big stainless steel or copper kettles. You see guys and girls walking around with hair nets. The floors look clean enough you can pack and eat off them, right? Right? Not back then. Brew houses were drafty, dirty, dusty places. The beer was brewed in open vats. And by open vats, I mean no covers, okay? Despite these conditions, brewers back then made some darn good beers. I almost said the wrong way. Darn good beers, okay? I'd like to use your imagination. I'm going to put you in 1601. You're in a small village on the outskirts of Amsterdam. We're watching a master brewer at work. Got that in your mind, okay? He has decided today to make his beer from barley. It's a grain, it's available, he's gonna make it from barley. Step one, soak the barley seeds in water. We don't have to do that today. I mean, well, we do, but not the way he did it. He had to let him uh, soak in water until he actually germinated and actually sprouted. This was important because it released the starch inside the seed, and we need the starch, okay? Once the seeds sprouted, they were put aside to dry, usually in the rafters of the dusty, drafty, dirty beehives, brewhouse. Finally, they dry. Eventually, they're gonna dry. And he's gonna grind them into a powder called malt. And I don't forget what I grew up. Hmm. That doesn't say, yes, this is malted barley, okay? Uh, we can pass around it, 
I actually want that. But this, this is it. Looks like power. Okay. Takes this malt and he puts it into a big open vat. No lid, open vat. And he boils it. Every once in a while, he takes a big wooden paddle and he stirs it up. Doesn't want that malt to settle down. He wants it to dissolve. Now he's going to stop right here. We're not doing nothing else. If he does nothing else, stops right here, he'll end up with that same beverage that was produced by accident 8,000 years ago. Won't taste very good. Well, he's going to drink it, or he's going to get a nice buzz. But we're working with a master brewer. We're observing a guy who knows what he's doing. And he's learned from the experience of hundreds, if not thousands, of other brewers before him. He's got to add something else. And that something else is hops. I told you before, we talk about hops. I'm a man of my word, we talk about hops. A hop plant looks like any kind of a climbing, vining plant that you might have in your garden. A cucumber plant. Um, the um, sweet pea plants that I like to go in my garden. The flower kind, they climb up on it and they got a little yellow on it. You know? That's what a hop plant looks like, basically. In the 8th century the AD, the French discovered if they use the flower of the hop plant, they'll make that disgustingly sweet alcoholic beverage a little bit better. Real drinkable beverage. And they add hops to their uh, boiling water and, and malt. Now, boiling water and uh, hops and malt will have a name. Not Fred. Charlie, it's wort. So I now use the word wort. I'm talking about wort and wort, uh, yeah, wort and hops, okay? So we've got uh, this, uh, this uh, hops. Uh, uh, the French discovered it uh, um, in the 8th century. I like to say they stumbled on it because what would make you think hops would work? They were trying everything. They would have tried this handkerchief if they had it. They got to make this disgusting sweet beverage more palatable. So by the uh, 9th century, it's in Germany, and by the 1600s, the year we're talking about, everybody in Western Europe is using hops. Agreed? Everybody okay? Okay, so we, now we got our water, he's stirring every once in a while, this big wooden paddle, and we're working with a master brewer. Master brewer. He knows, maybe halfway through the process, so maybe a little, oh, wait a minute, I didn't tell you the, the job of the first batch of hops. Oh, my goodness. The first batch of hops, as they break down and dissolve, they got a specific job. They're going to make that disgustingly sweet malt water a little less sweet. Or another way to look at it is more bitter. So they're called bittering hops. So you got this wort, you got one kind of hop in it, we got uh, water, we got the malt, we're stirring the water. We're stirring Probably a little past the halfway mark. He'll know, he's the master brewer. He's going to add some more hops. Same kind of hop? Maybe. Different hop? Maybe. He's the master brewer. He knows what he's doing. I don't know what he's doing. I'm just a drink what he makes. This hop won't be in the wort as long as the first batch of hops. So we'll not completely dissolve our bread down. It's going to add its unique flavor. So they're called flavoring hops. Pretty cool, man. At the very end, near the very end of his brewing process, he's discovered he's a master brewer. He's going to add some more hops. They won't have any time to break down. And they're going to add their unique aroma to his beer. Everybody, they're called aromas. Come on, the brewer's the only guy. Come on, aromas. Everybody should know that, right? All right, so our brewer's doing this. He's stirring everything. And he's a master brewer. So based on his experience, and what he sees, and what he smells, and what he tastes, time to put the fire out, let this sucker cool down, and keg my wort into beer. Now before he kegs it, he's going to filter it, because there'll be particles of malt that didn't completely dissolve, particles of the hop that didn't completely dissolve. He's brewing it in an open vat, so there'll be the odd grasshopper, leaf and other debris that fell in. So you're going to filter that out. If he filters it once and only once, he's going to end up with a nice, strong beer or strong air. 
Okay? He fills it seven times. He'll end up with beer, ale, less than 2% alcohol. Small beer or near beer, everybody drinks this to stay hydrated. Anybody else? Okay. If you remember the definition I gave you of beer way back in the beginning, and you listen carefully to my description of the brewing process, it seems our brewer has left something out. Don't answer. Let's see what we're saying. Uh, what did he leave out? Yeast. Say it. Yeast. He left out the yeast. Well, you know why he left out the yeast? He didn't know how to put yeast in. Yeast is a small microorganism that's floating around in the air. And then the whole brew houses that were dusty, dirty, and drafty, there's plenty of yeast. And when yeast falls into the water, something magical happens. <laughs> it eats the complex sugars released during the brewing process. Now the starch inside the seed, now it's become very complex sugars. Got scientists who draw the arrows, you know, CO2 and this, that. very complex. It eats these complex sugars, turns them into ethanol. also gives out uh, uh, bubbles, the gas, uh, the bubble, the combination in, in, in our beer. Make sense? Now, he's going to back me up on this. Yeast has a very long and complicated connection with beer. And I have to be honest that there's a couple of facts I still have not been able to uncover. You might have uncovered them, I doubt it, because you don't even know these facts to do it. But if you do, share it with me. Okay? Uh, beers, sorry, yeast actual role in brewing is not fully explained and understood to the work of Louis Pasteur in the 1850s and 1860s. Pasteur, the guy who gave us pasteurization, the guy who invented the uh, rabies vaccine, using the scientific method and his trusty old microscope, you can get that one from Amazon, by the way. You pay big bucks for that one. He discovers and proves beyond any shadow of a doubt that yeast is the fermentation agent in beer. Now this leads to two major changes. The first one is with the Bavarian uh, brewing uh, laws passed in 1516. The, the brewers in Bavaria, a state in Germany, agreed uh, they're going to make beer oh, they got three ingredients. More water and hops, that's it. Put anything else in, you gotta call something else. Call vodka if you want, I don't care, it's not beer. So now we've got to add another list, another item to this list, and that list is gonna be uh, yeast. Also, it will change the way brewers brew beer. They are now brew beer in closed vats, kettles, we call it, right? Closed. Yeast can't get in there from the atmosphere. Only the yeast I put in, the yeast I want to use, the yeast that has characteristics that I want in my brew. And brewers pitch their yeast. They throw it in. Well, they know when they're the master brewer. They throw it in there. And then the yeast does this job that I already explained to you. Now, brewing process back then and brewing process today, is obviously there's some differences, but they're really minor differences. The major difference, I think, personally, is sanitary. <laughs> it's much cleaner. Uh, also, volume. A small, even a small brewer like yours is still going to produce more than that guy did. Okay? And, of course, the pitching of the yeast is now controlled. Ah, I lost. What did you just say? I don't know anything. We're okay. Okay. That takes us almost to Peter Brown, the last B. But we got to get him here. He's, in, he's over in Europe. we got to get him here. we got to explain how he gets here. Sorry, but the teacher in me can't leave you not knowing anything. Okay? So Peter Brock is born in Sweden, and in 1645, he finds himself in the port city of Amsterdam in the nation of the Netherlands, Holland, okay? the home of the Dutch. And there he meets and falls in love with the lovely, oh my God, ready? Alexei. Jans Van Goodbook. I say it right this time, sometimes I trip over it. Well, I bet you she was glad to become Alexei Brock. I <laughs> have to write that on the check. <laughs> well, the romantic person in me, the one that my wife fell in love with, 
I like to think they met on a blind date overlooking the moonlit waters of Amsterdam's canals. Not even how they met. That makes a good story. But they meet, they wed, and they move to the new world. Okay? To um, the colony of uh, the New Netherlands, and they end up in the city of Beverwick, which you know is. Oh, okay. You weren't paying attention. They were getting an egg on the test. Now, they must have both been very hard workers, because by 1850, they've been there just about a year, they own some property and some buildings. They're doing okay. Okay, they're a young couple of the, uh, of the times. Peter's got, besides the buildings, he's got a millstone. And he says, you know, I take that millstone, I take this guy's wheat, I grind it into flour, and sell it to this guy's bakery. Or I take this guy's wheat, I turn it into malt, I sell it to this guy's brewery. Or I build my own brewery, I make my own beer. I sell my beer to the biggest beer makers and beer drinkers of Beverwick. I got through without stumbling over any of the bees. <laughs> okay. He's got one slight problem. In 1650, I'm sorry, in 1650, um, Beverwick's at its legal limit of two breweries. The city father said only two. It was their attempt to control the drinking habits. People get drinking too much and having a good time. So Peter says, no, you know what? Uh, okay, I got that. I'm going to appear before the city council. And I'm going to convince them that I should be able to build another brewery. Now, when he stands before the city council, he doesn't come with a PowerPoint presentation. Okay? He doesn't have graphs and charts and flow charts and statistics up the wazoo. He doesn't have letters from prominent citizens of Beverwick. This guy should do it. No. He doesn't have petitions. He comes with a very simple argument. A. That's the Brooklyn in me. A. If you let me build a brewery, I'll have some kegs of beer, and you can tax those kegs of beer like you tax everything else, and the more money will flow into the treasury. Well, the city fathers may be politicians, but they're not stupid politicians. Okay, go ahead and build your brewery. Good idea. Now, you would think. Which one is mine? This one. Time out. You would think that Peter would want me to show his appreciation would be a good corporate citizen. You follow all the rules, be a straight arrow, and not rock the boat. Uh, that doesn't describe Peter. <laughs> Got one word for Peter, the pro -maker. He's always in trouble with the city fathers. He's always pushing on the envelope, breaking the rules. His name appears in the record so often that I am convinced, not only did he know the county clerk on a first name basis, he knew the names of all the children and when they were born. He's always in there. By 1662, he realizes he is persona non grata. It's time to get out of Dodge. He sells off his holdings, pays off his debts, and takes a walk down an Indian trail. He can't even say old Indian trail because Right? America is 16, 16, not very old. He walks down this Indian trail and he buys 190 acres of land from the local Native Americans. That's 1662. In 1663, his wife and son join him and they make build a one-room house. By 1670s, there is an addition built to this house. And by 1740s, Peter's ancestors have built a, a big house that's attached to the 1663 house by something called the hyphen hallway. Now time for a commercial break. All three buildings are open to the public and we have a great curator who does a great tour. Unfortunately, you'll have to wait till next year because today the museum closes for the winter season. The buildings are all old, they're not heated, you don't want to be there. Okay, but if you haven't been there, go sometime. From, uh, 1663 till uh, 1929, Peter and his descendants will work this land. In 1929, the last direct descendant, notice the word is direct descendant. There are other guys out there floating around, distant cousins on his mother's side, sometimes he moved. 
But this is the last direct descendant, name is Leonard Bronkland, and he dies. He leaves what's left of Peter's estate, about 12 acres, to the Greene County Historical Society, with the understanding that they'll operate it at the museum, which they've done now for 93 years. Now, Peter is responsible for everything I just told you. I'm going to explain why. In 2004, I retired as a history teacher from Catholic High School. And some member of the board said, hey, Dick Muncho, he knows how to brew beer. Get him on the board. We can take advantage of this guy. And my first assignment as a member of the board of trustees of the Green County Historical Society is to learn all I can about Peter the Brewer, a drink called Flip, how to make it, and how to serve it. Well, that sounded like a real interesting challenge, so I went right to work. And uh, what I just told you, that's the result of my research. Now, as a history teacher, I kind of knew about the Neolithic Revolution. I taught it for 30 years. I knew about uh, Rome. I knew about the uh, Henry Hudson. I knew all that stuff. But as a home brewer, I didn't need to know any of that other stuff. You don't need to know any of that stuff to be a brewer. I don't know the history of, of hops and yeast. I don't know any of that stuff. Heck, I believed until I did this report that Ben Franklin said, Peter, <laughs> I didn't know. So that's the, uh, what, how that came about. And I can't end with Peter if I just tease you with Flip. And I don't want to tease you. I want to tell you what Flip is, but it's a pretty cool drink. Flip was a very popular drink in colonial America, okay, before we became the United States of America, and even in the United States of America. If you read Herman Melville's Moby Dick, he had the crew of the Pequod sitting on the deck after a busy day chasing a white whale, drinking some Flip. And he doesn't explain it, because you would have known what Flip is. You grew up, you knew it. Very popular drink, Flip. Okay, now you're going to know what Flip is. Flip has three major ingredients. A dark bit of beer. I'm proud to say that I made that dark bit of beer for uh, uh, the historical site. Rum and molasses. You put them in whatever vessel you have. Believe it or not, when I demonstrate I use a glass gallon of pickle jar. Because I like people to see what happens. So you got the beer, the rum, molasses. Then you stick a hot poker into it, and it foams up. Really cool. That's the picture. That, oh, the, the Daily Mail always takes that picture and puts it in the paper. I want to take a picture of me. <laughs> okay. uh, the, the hot poker does three things. It caramelizes the sugars. It heats up the beer. Uh, the flip flip supposed to be a uh, winter drink. And it's a nice uh, smoky aftertaste. So if you want to make flip, go ahead. You've got all the ingredients. They're in a supermarket. What's the nearest supermarket? Tops? Go down, well, you can do it. However, you're not that in, uh, uh, adventurous. Uh, I cordially invite you to the next Heritage Craft Fair held on the grounds of the Bronx Museum. Uh, it's always held on the Sunday before Columbus Day weekend. And if you come there, you will see yours truly, dressed as Peter, preparing and serving flip to anyone who would be interested. And it's a pretty cool drink. Now, before I open the questions, I want to point out on the back showcase, I have four handouts. The first one on one side is the list of the first earliest breweries, a lot of bees today, breweries in Berwick. On the other side, the list of styles of beer. I'd like to talk to you later to see what styles you guys make. The next list has, the uh, next handout has my favorite song, the lyrics to Tom T's Hall, I Like Beer. And the, the beer prayer, okay, you got to read it, it's really cool. That prayer was read into the service at my uncle's funeral, okay? He was like me, a home brewer, and like me, he liked to enjoy different kinds of beers, so that he had to be, had to be read. Next, I have a, a two-sided envelope side card, and on one side you see a picture of the, the last big house that was built. And on the other side, a list of the events that go on at the, uh, went on at the, uh, at the Bonk House last year. Uh, give you an idea of what's going on. Uh, some of those events are repeated, some of the themes are repeated, speakers and stuff like that. 
Then there's an application to join the Green County Historical Society. And it's a place you want to be if you like educational programs like today. We have a lot of different guest speakers come on a lot of, a lot of different topics. Okay? So uh, it's a place to join. And I didn't have enough, but there's a copy of the messenger. And that you get, if you're a member of the society, you get twice a year. Tells you what's going on at the uh, museum and the Veteran Research Library. And then uh, a copy of the journal, which is full of local history. I'm very proud that I had four articles uh, published in the journal. And I'm now working on, I'm a member of the Leeds Volunteer Fire Company. And next year, we're celebrating our 100th anniversary. So I've been busy going to the Veteran Research Library and all the paperwork and upstairs in the firehouse to create uh, a, an article for the journal and for us on the history of our fire company. I'm very, very excited. I can't, unbelievable things I've already discovered. <sighs> I thank you for your patience and your attention. Questions, anything? When you make and we don't have the, the, do you heat it up? Well, you can put it in a microwave, oh. but it'll be your version of flip. You won't have the smoky after this, oh, okay. but you can do it. You can use a log. Oh, I hate brown dark beers. I, I would use a log. It'll be your version of flip. Just do me a favor, don't use a non-alcoholic or light beer. I think that would be sacrilegious. <laughs> I think beer blanc, Jacob Plank and all the brewers that came before me would be rolling in their graves. By the way, I never found a definitive piece of evidence that served. This is really crazy. I never found a piece of evidence that proved beyond any shadow of doubt that Peter served it. He probably did, but I never saw a menu. So I don't know if he ever did. Now, but yeah, you can do it any way you want. Other questions? Yes? When you make, when you make beer, at least I make beer. Oh, yeah, cool. Get it to like 6% alcohol. Say again? I'll get to 6% alcohol. You get to 6? Okay. I have a recipe. Well, some people get to 8, 9. Oh, yeah. How do they do that? Oh, wait a minute. Jerry Kaden, what do you do? Oh. When I first started brewing beer many years ago, when I was a young man, I was two years old, my uh, goal was to make every beer in this recipe, in this pork here. But I found certain beers that I really, really like and make them all the time. But there's one here for a Belgian ale that calls for nine pounds of malt. Now, that means there's much more, many, much more? Much more, that's what I say, much more complex sugars in the uh, wort to be turned into alcohol. So that becomes, that one's, I think, I don't have my, uh, it might be here. Anyway, I think it was about 9%. The first time we drank that beer, we drank it at a 22 ounce box. And it was really good. <laughs> so my friend said, you got any more of this stuff? Yeah, sure, I just made five gallons of it, it's ready to go, let's have another. Boy, this is really good. Got any more of this stuff? Yeah. So there we drank 66 ounces of this 9% beer. And the wife pulls in the driveway, runs out and calls it, Uncle Tony's been in an accident, we gotta get it. You're not taking his wife to the hospital. You guys are all six feet to the wind. I'll do it. Well, save me. I'm going to take a margarita up to the hospital. Yeah, you, the most common question asked, nobody asked it. And I'm glad you're here, because I don't know the answer for, for you guys. When you brew beer at home, you brew it at, am I OK? Yep. When you brew beer at home, you brew it at five gallons at a time. And on the average, average, it's about a pound of wool for every gallon. About. You can have, I have some that less and nine gallons. When you brew beer in your in the big vats, how much what do you put in there? How much water in more? Uh, usually the batches uh, if they're in a two barrel batch is sixty five gallons, uh, depending on the recipe, right. usually 120 to 130 pounds of water. Right. The recipe the, the, the pound is will determine the alcohol content. Yeah. When you brew beer at home at five gallons at a time, excuse me, you usually end up with about Oh, I didn't show it. Well, it doesn't matter, because they're not really. Uh, uh, we end up putting, at the most, three ounces of hops. Now, the, the hops are the flower of the hop plant. And do you use wet hops or dry hops? I use hops, okay. yes. These are called pellet hops or dry hops. The flower is wet. It's, it's a flower. So, these, these, these are the pellets. They look like dog food. 
or something every four times. Um, most recipes call for, at the most, three ounces for five gallons. Um, on the average, typical, you put an ounce of hops at the beginning. All right, here's your test. What do they do? Oh, you can't get an answer to that. <laughs> what do they do? They make it bitter. They make it less sweet. Then you might, you might add some hops about halfway through. What do they do? You all failed my testing. Right? Well, you didn't have notes, so I figured they make the flavor, whatever that unique flavor is. And then at the end, you might, I, I make only a couple of my recipes uh, add aroma hops. You know what I did? I made my own beer. With my own recipe, you can't get it anywhere in the world unless you come to my house. <laughs> I made all the brewing decisions. I picked, and I'm not going to give any clues away. I picked what grain or grains I was going to use. And you don't know if I use one or 17 grains, you don't know. What um, hops I would use. Would I use bittery? Would I use slavery? Would I use, would I use, I'm not telling you. I decided what kind of yeast to use, and I decided how much of my honey from my own hives that I use in my honey brown ale. You can't get any else in the world, and I'm very, I think I'm very proud of it, because it always gets a nice compliment. But the people who are drinking it are my friends and my family, and they're getting it for free. <laughs> So I think no matter what it tastes like, you're going to get a good review. <laughs> but you can back me up on this. You use the same thing all the time. It's going to change. Right? I once tried different, a different hop, but my taste buds aren't sophisticated enough to see if there was a major difference. So right, same as yeah, So I just, I, had, I think I picked, I want to say I picked uh, Steering Golden, but I'm not sure. I have it written down at home. And, uh, I went back that day after this, of course, I had a lot of time. I brought them on sale. Any other questions? Yes, sir? Peter was a sailor for the Dutch East Indies Company. Yes, I, well, he was an emergency seaman. Did I say he was an emergency seaman, Luis? I meant to say that. And the laws of the New Netherlands, of Netherlands, required that a ship had to take X number of kegs of beer for the voyage to make sure all the sailors had access to beer for the entire trip. And it was beer, all right, let's see how good they are. Why did they bring all this beer on this trip? Oh, you know the answer. Why? They wanted to be hydrated. Oh, I like this lady. Why didn't that say you to get rip and drunk? It was to stay hydrated. Flip was consumed as a warm beer to warm you up on a cold night on, out on, the, on the ocean. And the other question, you guys ask good questions. Very patient audience, very attentive, and very good questions. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I think, um, that man will miss him. Yeah. Um, monks, Belgium, um, they still brew with open bags? Yes, there, is, there are some old timers who still insist on brewing in open bags, which I would think, I'm not an expert on this, you can back me up on this. Technically, I would think that would mean that every batch would have a very slight difference because there'd be different yeast. But your taste buds got to be super sophisticated to know that. But yes, there are in Belgium. The, the Belgian brought up Belgium. The Belgian monks, they had nothing to do but sit in their monastery, pray, copy manuscripts, okay, and, and brew beer. And they have some of the most complicated recipes. One of the, my Belgian ale, I think it's got like nine ingredients, grains of paradise, rock candy, uh, I don't know if that's in the book. I, uh, they, they, they made some really complicated uh, beers. They're all ales because they're, they're brewed with at least at 70 degrees, and they're really very good. We, I make my Belgian ale once every three years. That's because it's a Christmas ale, so we drink it only at Christmas time. We celebrate my sons and myself, and my daughters, my sons are my son-in-law, but we don't use that word. Uh, my daughters, and my, we, have, we, have, we toast the, the new Christmas, the New Year's with, with a nice, nice Belgian. And that back next year, i got to make it, because we've got enough just to get through this Christmas. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am? I don't have a question, I have an observation. An observation? Yes. 
I, I moved too much. <laughs> no, I was a principal of the school, and I'll tell you one thing. I would have hired you in a second as a history teacher. Oh. You are an outstanding teacher. Well, thank you. That's a, you're I, welcome. Well, you're a very nice audience. We are so attentive. Wow. I loved I loved teaching. I had a ball. Uh, we can tell. I, and one reason I moved around is because I would lecture. There would be a, a framework of the outline on the one. But you know, kids, they don't pay attention to this. And I'd always be walking around, hey, well, Johnny, you didn't write down that day. I told him that's what I So I got in the habit of always. Going. But thank you. I, I love teaching. I, I don't miss it too much because I filled my life with so many adventures. Uh, the, histor uh, the historical society, uh, my hobbies, my eight grandchildren, I'm always doing something. But thank you. That, that means a lot. I love teaching. Where did you, where were you a principal? Uh, in North Carolina. Ah, I, I couldn't teach there my accent. <laughs> when I was teaching, you Bronx accent. <laughs> you'll get a kick out of this. When I was teaching, I would go down every once in a while to my, see my mom and dad. And on Monday, the kids say, hey, Mr. Marshall, you know, walk down the city. <laughs> yeah, Hi, your accent's back. <laughs> now, when I go to the city, my cousins would say, hey, you're talking like upstate New York guy. Where's your Brooklyn? So, uh, can't win for losing. Anybody else? Good question. Uh, no one asked this one. To brew five gallons of beer. Always wonder, how much is the cost? Is it, is it cost efficient? Well, home brewers don't brew to save money. Right? We brew because we get the pleasure out of making it. But you can build five gallons for anywhere from the cheapest kit right now is about 34 bucks. And you'll get two cases of beer, 48 bottles. Uh, the Christmas sale is about 100 bucks. You still get two cases of 48 bottles. <laughs> you know, we don't brew to save money. Uh, I brew because I, I take pride in what I produce, and like you do, and I like to see people, you know, try it. I, if my father, God rest his soul, if he never tried any of my home beer brews, he died before I got into the hobby. But I would never give him one time that. Because he didn't drink. He wouldn't appreciate it. I remember at, at my wedding, I saw him with a scotch and soda in his hand. I'm really surprised because he doesn't drink. An hour later, I saw him with a gin and tonic. An hour later, he had a glass of beer. He never drank any of them, but he was being social. <laughs> <laughs> My father-in-law, God rest his soul, he introduced me to drinking beer for the flavor and the aroma. I was a young college kid. I knew what everybody did. I drank Budweiser. Hey, the king of beer! Did you get that one drunk on Budweiser? Go to my father-in-law's house, open the refrigerator, there'd be 48 bottles of beer in, 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 on the wall, right? And there'd be like 24 different kinds. And Dad showed me, you don't drink beer to get drunk. You look for the aroma. You look for the uh, flavors. You want to drink a nice, balanced beer. Unless you drink an IPA, you don't want to really identify the hops in the malt. You want a nice, right, balanced beer. IPAs, um, IPAs were uh, invented in 1815 in the Napoleonic Wars, and Britain, British Empire by then it's got it's growing, and they want to drink beer. So if you leave England on a Tuesday in March, you might make it to India on next March, <laughs> right? With sailing ships. So they would load up their pale ales with lots of hops, and hops serve as a preservative, so the beer would last from here to India, India Pale Ale, right? And they would hop the heck out of it. And it's still hoppy. Now they make double IPAs, they're making quadruple IPAs, right? Because people, some people like super bitter beers. I, I'm not, I have to be in the mood for an IPA. I like wheat beers. Do you make bourbon beers? The, the latest craze among brewers is you go and you buy a bourbon barrel from a distillery. They can only use it once. They gotta throw it out. So you get a bourbon barrel and you let your beer age in the bourbon barrel. I looked into it. If I got a bourbon barrel, the smallest one I could find was 200 gallons. So I have 200 gallons of bourbon beer. I only make about 50 gallons a year. That wipes out the whole budget. So I, I, I may be stupid, but I'm not dumb. I took wood chips and I soaked them in bourbon. <laughs> Put them on the shelf and forgot about them. Maybe a month or two later, I don't remember, I floor it down, the bourbon's all absorbed into wood chips. Then you take your wort, OK? 
okay? And you, you uh, filter it, you want to get rid of a lot of the un, uh, un, um, dissolved um, um, malt and hops. You filter it and you put it what they call a secondary fermentation tank. All it is is a five gallon food bag. And you put the bourbon chips in there and you leave it alone. And a month or two later, I have to it down. Open it up and you take a scoop. And if the bourbon uh, wood chips are bleached white like chiplets, okay, <laughs> all the bourbon's been bleached in. I, I like bourbon because I just, I just bought a red ale kit and I'm going to make red ale, uh, bourbon red ale. So. Yeah, it, it's, I've made whiskey brown ale, um, bourbon red ale before, bourbon brown ale. Uh, I've had a lot of fun. It's, uh, my friend and I looked into buying the barrel, but even if we split the course, it's too much. And then what are we going to do? We even split the gallons. We got 50 gallons of or 200, whatever the hell the number was. Bring it here next year. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll tell you what you do. Join the Historical Society. Watch for the date, because I'm going to do this at the Historic Society next year as a fundraiser, and we're going to have some homebrews to try. Or I'll come to, well, no, I won't have the bourbon red ale at uh, the Heritage. All I do at Heritage Craft is a uh, is a flip. But we do have uh, uh, a bounce available. They found uh, the, the Bronx family recipe for bounce, which is basically moonshine flavored with fruits. The day they found it, Dick, Dick, get over here, you gotta make this stuff. <laughs> and I don't make the, the moonshine, it's too complicated. But you buy uh, Everclear, which is uh, moonshine, the freshly made. And then you, you uh, make a sugar water syrup. I don't, I don't have all the recipe written down. Anyway, and I make a gallon at a time, and you put fruit in it. You just let it, the fruit flavor. In it. I made a banana one. My friend said, you're a crazy banana. Why does it end up costing nothing? And after about six weeks, the bananas didn't look too good. That's all right. I took the bananas out. I tasted it. Okay, so I put fresh bananas in, and boy, did that come out great. You pour that on a banana split. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Anything else? I have a passion for the subject, as you can tell. So, what do you mean? Do you, do you mean like a, a gallon? Yeah. It, you don't need the little bottles, the bottles, the pint bottles and stuff like that if you wanted to. Well, I got 37 friends and relatives who like my mouse. See, I gotta make it a gallon. I make it in a gallon pickle jar, very super clean, and you can't smell pickles. You never know what's in it. And would allow me to make up the numbers because I don't really remember numbers. All written down. I think it's three to one sugar. Use three waters and one thing of sugar. I forget. It's all written down. And then you put in the Everclear. And it's all written down. And then I put as much fruit as I can into that thing. I cover the lid. I put a event on it, you know, air event, in case uh, not to, uh, nothing really going to happen, but it happened. And then you just let it sit for a while. And then you taste it. If it don't taste good enough, you take that whole fruit out, put a little fruit in. Really simple. We got uh, that June cookbook that we put together. That's right. right. With the rest Did of you it. bring any? I didn't bring any. Oh, hey, jeez. <laughs> you have to come to the uh, Bronx Museum in uh, May when we open again. And there is the recipe for making bounce. Then I'll give you a word of advice. Don't make it with cherries. You know why? It tastes just like cough medicine. It's <laughs> alcohol and cherries. Try, I made it with bananas, raspberries, blueberries, uh, peaches, plum was great, pears, lemons. Who, who knows lemon shell? You compare. Bounce, lemon bounce with lemon shallow, you can't tell the difference. It's the same thing. Okay. Mm -hmm. It really is. You know how I make my bounce? I mean my lemon shallow? I use the whole lemon. I don't peel it. I just wash it, take off a little little knob at the top, any stickers that they put on it, wash it. And you know how my what my lemon shallow looks like? Clear. Because if they use lemon shallow is a Lombardi drink. And what they do is they peel the lemon off and they let it sit in grain alcohol. 
But when you peel the lemon, no matter how careful you are, you're going to get the white stuff, the pith, the pith, right? I say pith, and the pith, the pith makes it cloudy. So I said to myself, self, why don't you try just using the whole lemon? And I did. I just let it rot there. And it, it tends, sometimes, if I, maybe I guess if I let it rot too long, it might have a tinge of yellow if you catch the light right. But basically it's clear. And no one knows this lemon shell. I was there for my sister. My sister is still lives on uh, Long Island, okay? She says, we live in the boondocks up here. But they'll come down to New York City, the rest of America. That's my sister. And she, she, I gave her some lemon cello once. And here, have my lemon cello. Oh, God, what is lemon cello? It's not lemon cello. You give me vodka. I don't, give me some lemon cello. Have lemon cello. And she, she gave me her seal of approval, which is pretty cool for my sister, of course. She don't approve everything. Did you pull cold, No. I just, just dropped the whole the, Because the, the lemon essences and oils in the skin will eventually be absorbed. And if you don't like the flavor, it's say, hey, it's not lemony enough, just take those lemons, put some more lemon in. I don't think I had to do that. The banana is the only one I remember how to do that with. But the lemon, I don't think I did that. Just let it rot. You'll get it. Try it, it's really fun. Come and buy the book. Damn it, why didn't I bring some books to see? Raise some money for the museum. Any other questions? Yes? It's a comment. A comment. A couple of weeks ago, I had the honor of speaking to the Albany colony of descendants of the Mayflower. So, a bunch of pilgrims, fun people to hang out with. But one of the main reasons why the Mayflower landed on Cape Cod instead of the Virginia Territory, where they were supposed to be, was they ran out of beer. <laughs> and somebody said, well, what's that got to do with the Puritans? And the answer was, what would you rather drink after two months at sea? Beer that was in a barrel or water? Mm -hmm. so. The water was not very safe to drink. No. By the way, this society has over 60,000 members, which means those Puritans weren't so pure. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. One of the things, if you look at some of the old Dutch paintings from the 1600s, everybody in the family drinks. Grandma, grandpa, mom, dad, kids, babies. Man, you had to stay you had to stay hydrated. I grew up in an Italian family. And we always had wine on our table. Even me. I learned later on they were watering it down, but I grew up learning to drink wine respectfully, um, without going you know, you don't and my father made their own wine and and Italian, we didn't have much of a recipe. Pasta on Monday, pasta on Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> what the red wine went with the pasta. There's a lot of, how many of bodies? Any more bodies? Yeah. All right, right? We can have pasta seven days in a row and never have the same kind, right? You got a pesto sauce, you got bol bolognese, you got, right? So that's what I grew up with. We always had a glass, and now I know, watered down wine on the table. I, I, I can't drink wine anymore. My, for some reason, it bothers me. I'm, I'm in a lot of trouble when beer starts at <laughs> Hard alcohol seems to bother my gut. I guess I'm old. Thank you, Dick. It's great. Thank you. I want to just turn it over to Steve for a few minutes so you can tell yeah, us a little bit about this. Rail the River. I've got to, to put this off so I don't curse anymore. Steve, you want to take this? Oh, sure, yeah. Thanks. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming out. I'm Steve Douglas. I am the owner of Rail to River Brewing on 109 Main Street, Avena. We are approaching our one year anniversary. It'll be the day after Thanksgiving. And, uh, and the outpouring and support of the community has been incredible. It has exceeded my expectations. We have great, we've met great friends. We have uh, many regulars who are some people seated in, in our audience today. Um, uh, I've been making beer off and on uh, since 1986. My first batch was attempted in a bathtub in base housing in Catholic Iceland. I was in the service at the time, and uh, me and, and uh, another, another guy I was stationed there with said, after a few beverages, of course, we said, let's make some beer. I have a, I have a can of malt extract. And so we scrubbed the bath, bathtub, filled it with hot water, dumped in the malt, stirred it, and then we looked at each other and go, 
what the hell do we do now? <laughs> we really didn't study up on the process or anything like that. We figured all we do is just make it, let it sit for a little while, and we're gonna have beer, you know. But fortunately, we didn't tie up this uh, this poor guy's bathtub for months at a time. So we said, yeah, it's not gonna happen. So we ditched that process and. Uh, as I went on and on and you know, moved back to the States and I was able to live off base, I started making small batches uh, on the stove top, as Dick has probably done in the past, uh, using plastic buckets, using picnic coolers, and then uh, when I retired from the service out in Tucson, Arizona, I moved back here and actually bought a really nice stainless steel Bruce out making 10, 5, 10 gallon batches. And about four years ago, uh, me and a couple of friends, we were, it was going to be a partnership between three of us. Uh, that didn't last. So I said, you know what, I'm going to go solo with this. We scouted some buildings in the area. Uh, we landed on 109. It had a great history. It's an old building from the late 1800s, uh, high tin ceilings, and beautiful wooden floors. We said, this is great. And we landed on the name Rails River, for obvious reasons. This is a rail and river community. Uh, and it's been going great ever since. Um, I make all my beers on premises. I make two barrel batches and one and a half barrel batches. A two barrel batch is roughly 65 gallons. One and a half barrel is about 45 gallons. I do canning, uh, limited cans, and I do growlers, the glass growlers, if you can bring them in. And, um, and we also have uh, various beer and uh, beer mixes and uh, fruit beer rare mixes, uh, which you really can't find or see in other breweries. So I think it's a our unique niche here in Regina is, is that, that that type of mixture that we do. What styles do you make? I make I currently make an oatmeal stout, I make a red rye IPA, I make an extra special bitter, I make an American blonde, I make a, uh, I just did a porter, I have done, I have an uh, Oktoberfest Martzen, on tap, and I'm missing one English pale ale. That's it. Wow, you got a lot. I'm coming open. <laughs> Something we're open right now. Oh. What um, are the hours and, and the exact address? It is 109 Main Street, right, right down the street here. I mean, it's just if you're heading down towards Queens, just before you go into the railroad tracks, we're right on the left, big tall three-story building. Uh, our hours are uh, four to nine on Thursday and Friday. One to nine on Saturday, one to six on Sunday. Was that the Pulver House? No, that was the that was next door, and that's the building I put it down. The <laughs> former Odd Fellows Temple. Yeah. Oh, all right. The old post office. The old, yeah. the old, the old post, post office, office and the old RCS library at one time. Yeah. 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 Any other questions? Did you ever find the, 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 the Have you ever run across the definitive date for yeast being accepted? on the Bavarian? No, I haven't really dug that far. I I have, I'm looking for that date. All I keep saying is later on, yeast is added. But there should be a date close to, to uh, Pasteur's work because that's the definitive piece, but I've never found it. Yeah, that, that's the purity law called the Rhine Heights I believe I pronounced that correctly. Right. Yeah. 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 Three, three ingredients. All right, great. Thank you. Steve has some samples over yeah. here. So. Nice.